tayo titigil hanggat di nagwawagi Ang ating mitiging magkapantay, pantay Walang magsasamang tala, walang mag-aabi Yan ang sandigan ng ating pamumuhay Ilalaban natin ang bagong kaisipan Nang pinakasulong na uli ng lipunan Mananalig ang diwa ng proletaryo Bawat hapang natin patungong sosyalismo Good afternoon everyone and welcome to the last part of the Endeline online series for this month. Now we're talking about scientific socialism. But first, Anakbayan Europa condemns the slaying of the former Gabriela Southern Tagalog, Secretary General and anti-mining advocate Rona Jane Orca RJ Manalo in the hands of the 3rd Marine Brigade during an armed encounter on September 3 at Barangay Mainit, Brooks Point, Palawan. RJ joined the struggle for the liberation of women against feudal and patriarchal systems. She is loved by all the mothers and children in the slum communities in Laguna, Cavite, and Rizal. The Mangyan and Palawan tribal women will truly admire you for your kindness, bravery, and determination. Rest in power and justice for Ka RJ. We also mourn the passing of Ka Ebon Tess who wholeheartedly supported the fight for genuine liberation of women. Every Gabriela action you were there supporting. Your life and passion to serve the people serve, to serve as an inspiration to us all. Our condolences to his wife, Tita Obes, and his loved ones. Mabuhay ka, Kaeb! So, now we begin. So, let's all welcome Jose Maria Sison, author of The Basic Principles of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, and the Chairperson Emeritus of the International League of People Struggle. Good afternoon, Tito, and welcome. How are you? Uh, good afternoon. Warmest revolutionary greetings to you, Sarah, and to all our listeners. I'm happy that we are now at the uh, uh, last part of the uh, webinar series on the basic principles of Marxism-Leninism. Uh, so, we have reached uh, this uh, uh, final subject in the series, Scientific Socialism. Yes, Tito. So, um, we begin. So, what is scientific socialism? You have stated three other forms of socialism, reactionary, conservative, and bourgeois, and, and critical utopian. How is scientific socialism different from them? Uh, scientific socialism is the theory and practice of the modern industrial proletariat for revolutionary class struggle to emancipate itself together with other oppressed people and become the ruling class in lieu of the bourgeoisie to bring about and develop a society in which the means of production are under public ownership and planned production for the common good of the people rather than for the private profit of a few and thereby to prepare the way for the classless communist society. The Communist Manifesto, drawn up by Marx and Engels for the Communist League in 1848, laid down for the first time the comprehensive theoretical foundation of scientific socialism. Previous to this, socialism was a loose term referring to various <laughs> trends of thought, denouncing the abuses of the bourgeoisie on the proletariat, and seeking to ameliorate the condition of the latter. The manifesto in its third section identifies three forms of socialism preceding scientific socialism. One, reactionary, two, conservative and bourgeois, and three, critical utopian socialism and communism. The reactionary socialist included the feudal socialist, the petty bourgeois socialist, and the German or so-called true socialist. In common, they reacted to and opposed the new historical conditions brought about by the bourgeoisie and proposed some backward model of community, like the monastery or the guild system in feudal society. Marx and Engels regarded them as foolhardy and reactionary for wanting to turn back the wheel of history. The conservative and bourgeois socialists included a number 
of economists, philanthropists, and petty do-gooders who believed that the grievances of the proletariat should be redressed within the capitalist system and that anything good for the bourgeoisie was good for the proletariat. The proletariat was urged not only to stay within the bounds of bourgeois society, but also to cast away all ideas of class struggle so that it can enjoy the bourgeois system as the new Jerusalem. The critical utopian so socialist and communist included Henri Saint-Simon, uh, Charles Fourier, Robert Owen, and others who acknowledged the class antagonisms between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, but who could not as yet recognize the infant industrial proletariat of the early 19th century as a force capable of historical initiative or political movement. So uh, they believed in their separate ways that individuals like them from the ranks of the educated could transcend the class struggle and invent some form of social organization into which the workers would spontaneously and gradually enter for their own good and for the sake of social harmony. They therefore appealed to the sense of charity and philanthropy of the bourgeoisie <laughs> to either support or emulate their ideas and projects of class reconciliation. San Simon made the most panoramic proposal for the reorganization of society. He envisioned not only a new French society run by the industrialists, philosophers, physicists, chemists, astronomers, mathematicians, and other men of modern scientific learning for the benefit of the poor and actual producers in society, but also a federation of European states run along the same line. Followers of Fourier and Owen put up in America several isolated communities along the lines designed by their masters. So did the followers of the utopian socialist Cabet and Weitling, who had previously experimented in France and Germany, respectively. All these experimental societies broke up under the pressures of the surrounding capitalist society. Marx and Engels described the foregoing conceptions and projects as utopian building of castles in the air and fantastic pictures of the future of society, painted at a time when the industrial proletariat was still in a very under, undeveloped stage. But at the same time, they noted that these corresponded with the first instinctive yearnings of that class for a general reconstruction of society. They pointed to the critical element that made the utopian socialist and communist publications full of the most valuable materials for the enlightenment of the working class. These criticized every principle of bourgeois society and in this regard proposed quite a number of uh, practical measures, such as the abolition of the distinction between town and country and carrying on industries for the account of private individuals, the conversion of the functions of the states into a mere superintendence of production and so on. At the time of Marx and Engels, the socialists and communists of the utopian kind had degenerated into narrow religious sects, pedantically repeating the outdated writings of their departed masters, fanatically opposing political action by the workers and becoming more reactionary as the very conditions for socialism <coughs> became apparent. They could not keep pace with the growth. They could not keep pace with the growth so, of uh, uh, to an enlightenment of the working class. At the time of Marx and Engels, the socialists and communists of the utopian kind had degenerated into narrow religious sects. And uh, so uh, it would come to pass that uh, Marx and Engels uh, would appear on the scene. Engels, socialism, utopian and scientific, actually a section of uh, his book, anti During, elaborates on scientific socialism as the diametrical opposite of utopian socialism. Marxist socialism is scientific because it analyzes capitalism and grasps the law of motion that leads to its socialist transformation. 
of all pre-Marxist forms of socialism, utopian socialism came closest to the yearnings of an infant industrial proletariat, but fell far short of the theory of scientific socialism. Scientific socialism was formulated at a time that capitalism had developed sufficiently to reveal not only its past and present, but also its future. The very growth of modern industry and the proletariat could already be observed as contradictory with the capitalist relations of production. As the forces of production grew, the capitalist mode of production became increasingly marked by crisis. The Communist Manifesto avers that capitalism creates its own grave diggers, the proletariat and modern industry. The most incontrovertible proof for Marxist socialism as a scientific theory is a series of victories that the proletariat has achieved under its guidance. Socialist revolution and construction succeeded in the Soviet Union. China and other countries until modern revisionism was able to subvert socialism and restore capitalism. Thank you, Joe. Next question, what is class dictatorship? Why is that a main requirement for the establishment of a socialist society? Class dictatorship uh, of the proletariat simply means the worker state. The chief overall requirement for the establishment of a socialist society is that class dictatorship of the, of the proletariat. This means that state power must be in the hands of the proletariat as the ruling class in order to ensure socialist democracy for the proletariat and the entire people. Marxism or scientific socialism frankly admits that the proletariat or socialist state is a class dictatorship, unlike the bourgeoisie, which rep misrepresents its own state power or class dictatorship as a supra-class instrument for the common good of all classes, groups, and persons. As a class dictatorship, the socialist state is definitely turned against the bourgeoisie and other enemies of the people. The coercive uh, apparatuses of the state are used to guarantee, consolidate, and defend the worker state and the people's democratic rights, socialist revolution and construction against internal and external enemies. The socialist revolution deprives the bourgeoisie of its political power and its private ownership of the means of production. The determination of the, of the bourgeoisie to retain these or upon defeat to recover these can never be underestimated. Before a socialist society can be established, the bourgeoisie does everything in its power to prevent the victory of the proletariat. The arm strength of the proletariat at the inception of its rule is maintained and developed in the face of persistent threats from the domestic and international bourgeoisie. Okay, Tito, can democracy be practiced within a society with a class dictatorship of the proletariat? The class dictatorship of the proletariat against the exploiting classes means at the same time a socialist democracy for the proletariat and all other exploited people who have emancipated themselves. Without being able to put reactionaries and counter-revolutionaries in their proper places, the proletarian state would be incapable of uh, guaranteeing democracy for the entire people. The socialist constitution expressly upholds the class leadership of the proletariat on the basis of its alliance with all other democratic forces like the peasantry, the petty bourgeoisie, and others in the process of socialization. Decisive practical measures to favor the formerly exploited classes are spelled out in such a constitution. The Bill of Rights of the Socialist Constitution guarantees the basic rights and fundamental freedoms of individuals, groups, local communities, sectors, the former exploited classes, and the entire nation. The best of bourgeois liberal constitutions completely reframes from pointing to the existence of classes and class struggle. It deliberately uses abstract and universalistic references to individual rights without class distinctions of any kind in order to cover up and promote the effective legal right and freedom of the exploiting classes to exploit 
the great masses of individuals belonging to other classes and accounting for more than 90% of the population. Thank you, Tito. The next question, how necessary is armed struggle in obtaining class dictatorship? And when is a country ripe for armed struggle? Armed struggle is necessary because the ruling bourgeoisie will never give up its state power and private wealth voluntarily and give way peacefully to the proletarian and people who are determined to build socialism. And either so capitalist or feudal, semi-feudal country, armed revolution is justified and is likely to succeed when objective conditions favor it and the subjective forces of the revolution are strong enough. In the process of waging armed struggle, the proletariat forms the, the revolutionary army, which is the main component of state power. This army defeats the reactionary army and allows the proletariat and the people to build both the civil bureaucracy and the military machinery of the class dictatorship of the proletariat. This class dictatorship is the worker state, which defends itself, the people and the bourgeoisie and the socialist society from the attempts of the bourgeoisie to subvert or overthrow it. In a semi-colonial and semi-feudal country like the Philippines, the People's Democratic Revolution with a socialist perspective must win victory first before commencing the socialist revolution under the auspices of the People's Democratic Republic at the core of which is the proletarian class dictatorship. Even in industrial capitalist society, the proletariat must first win a struggle for democracy before it can conduct armed revolution to seize political power. In an industrial capitalist country, objective conditions are ripe for armed struggle when the crisis of the ruling system disables the ruling class from ruling in the old way and the subjective forces of the revolution are strong enough to carry out uprisings to disintegrate and dismantle the reactionarist army and other coercive apparatuses of the state. So far in history, the industrial capitalist countries have been most resistant to armed revolution unless they engage in war among themselves and conditions arise for a revolutionary uprising like the Paris Commune of 1871, under the conditions of the interim period is World War I, the First World War, uh, the, imperial, the Bolsheviks seized power through uprisings in the cities of Petrograd and Moscow, but the, but the fighting shifted to the countryside in the Civil War and in the war against foreign intervention after the uprisings in Petrograd and Moscow. In semi-colonial and semi-feudal countries, which are um, stricken by chronic crisis, the proletarian revolutionaries can avail of the vast area of maneuver in the countryside to wage a protracted people's war. This is well proven in the history of China and other countries. Objective conditions refer to the situation when the political and economic crisis of the ruling system becomes so serious as to violently split the ruling class and prevent it from ruling in the old way. Factions of the same ruling uh, class uh, fight among themselves. The ruling clique engages in open terror against a wide range of people and is extremely isolated. The people in general, including those unorganized, are disgusted with the system and are desirous of changing it. <clears throat> The subjective forces of the revolution refer to the conscious and organized forces of the revolution. These are the revolutionary party, the mass organizations, armed contingent, and so on. The, to gauge their strength fully, one has to consider their ideological, political, and organized uh, status and capabilities. The armed contingent of the revolution may be uh, small at the beginning, but the process of armed revolution can destroy and disintegrate a far larger reactionary army. The objective conditions are primary over the subjective factors. The former arise 
ahead of the latter and serve as the basis for the development of the revolutionary forces. The Communist Party cannot really be accused of inventing or causing the political and economic crisis of the bourgeois ruling system. The crisis arises from the internal contradictions of the ruling system. The armed revolution arises from the crisis conditions, the escalating conditions of oppression and exploitation and the eventual necessity of the people's resistance. You're right, Tito. The Duterte regime just gives more strength to the revolution. So next question. Different countries have different social political situations. You have described the Philippines as semi-feudal and semi-colonial. Can you describe what this means? Why is the Philippines not capitalist? Uh, the term semi-colonial and semi-feudal describe Philippine society. Semi-colonialism semi -colonialism is a distinctly political term that refers to the lack of full <laughs> national independence of the Philippines and to the continuing control of the Philippines by the U.S. and its imperialist allies. It is a long-standing term from Lenin who spoke of colonies, semi-colonies, and dependent countries being subordinate to the imperialist powers. Like the term semi-colonialism, semi-feudalism comes from Marxist-Leninist literature describing the Chinese economy before the victory of the Chinese Revolution in 1949. It is used to describe economies that have long been dominated by the commodity system of production and no longer by a natural economy of feudalism. But it is a merchant bourgeoisie rather than industrial bourgeoisie that is the chief ruling class based on land ownership or in partnership with the landlord class. If you wish, you can use the expression semi-feudal capitalism or big comprador capitalism to denote the economic dominance of the comprador big bourgeoisie in the Philippine economy. It is wrong to mean or insinuate that the Philippines is already industrial capitalist when one says that it is uh, capitalist uh, rather than uh, uh, semi-feudal. The Philippines is still imports its capital equipment from the industrial economies. Semi-feudalism is a precise term with a definite content. It is a kind of a non-industrial or pre-industrial and agrarian economy in which the comprador big bourgeoisie has arisen as the wealthiest and most powerful exploiting class from feudal haciendas as resource base for exports and in combination with the landlord class. Influenced by bourgeois economists, right-wing social democrats and Trotskyites, some people think that it is a term that has never been valid or has outgrown its validity. They think that an economy has to be exclusively feudal or capitalist. They do not understand that in its world history, capitalism grew out of the womb of feudalism, first in the form of the handicraft business, some light uh, pre-industrial manufacturing, and the merchants trading between town and country uh, before industrial capitalism surged forth as a dominant form of capitalism with the steam engine and then with the electromechanical equipment. Semi-feudalism is a term that refers to a kind of economy that evolved from feudalism and became starkly conspicuous in the 20th century in the Philippines with the rise of the comprador big bourgeoisie as the chief exploiting class in collaboration with the landlord class. Big compradors have long been big landlords who base themselves on their large landed states and use these to produce crops for export in exchange for the importation of finished products from abroad. The big comprador Ayala family and related families have not only owned banks and trading companies, but have also owned or managed big landed estates in Kalatagan and Nasugbu, Batangas, and elsewhere since the beginning of the 20th century. In recent times, in the 21st century, the recently deceased Eduardo Cojuanco owned the United Coconut Planters Bank and came to own the gigantic big comprador firm San Miguel Corporation, but she also owned uh, uh, some 20 haciendas in various provinces in the Philippines, as in Tarlac, Pangasinan, Isabela, Negros, Palawan, Agusan, Albay, and so on. 
Yeah, that's a lot, Tito. And not to mention, San Miguel Corporation is the highest earning corporation in Southeast Asia. Uh, next question. The Communist Party of the Philippines is waging a two-stage revolution. Why is a bourgeois democratic revolution necessary for a semi-feudal country in order to advance to socialism? Is it not possible to advance to socialism without this stage? It is uh, necessary to carry out first the new type of bourgeois democratic revolution, or otherwise called the People's Democratic Revolution, with a socialist perspective, and under the leadership of the proletariat, because the semi-colonial and semi-feudal conditions require that you must have a first fight and defeat the forces of foreign monopoly capitalism, domestic feudalism, and bureaucrat capitalism. In the course of uh, waging the people's democratic revolution, the proletariat builds the people's army, the revolutionary mass organizations, the national united front, and the local organs of political power, which constitute the provisional revolutionary government. When political power is seized by the proletariat from the uh, reactionaries and thereby the People's Democratic Revolution is basically completed, then the Socialist Revolution can commence immediately with the use of the proletarian dictatorship for seizing the commanding heights of the economy and securing the country and people from any further attacks from the imperialists and the reactionaries. Socialism is impossible and is not the immediate issue under conditions where the proletariat and the people are still under foreign and feudal domination and must first end this through people's war along the line of the new type of bourgeois democratic revolution. Okay, Tito, last question before we take a break. How will the di dictatorship dictatorship of the proletariat be achieved after a bourgeois democratic revolution? In the course of the bourgeois democratic revolution of the new type, or what I have been calling the People's Democratic Revolution, the apparatuses of the class dictatorship of the proletariat or the worker state are built. By the time that the bourgeois democratic revolution is basically completed through the seizure of political power, these apparatuses of state power uh, shall already be well developed in the hands of the proletariat, even as the proletarian dictatorship may take the form of people's democratic uh, dictatorship in a transition period. In the course of the People's War, the People's Army is developed by the proletarian revolutionary party as the main component of the future worker state or what may be otherwise called class dictatorship of the proletariat. The people's militia is also developed as the police force. The system of people's courts is developed. The organs of political power uh, learn to prosecute, try, judge, and detain or punish those proven or convicted as counter-revolutionaries and other criminals according to law. Thank you, Tito. Let, now let's take a break while listening to Alam ng Digmaang Bayan, Volume 2, by Rosel Valerio. Tech, take okay. it away. Hindi tayo itigil hanggat pinagwawagi Ang ating witiing magkabantay pantay, walang magsasamantala, walang mangaabi. Yan ang sandigan ng ating pamumuhay. Ilalaban natin ang bagong kaisipan ng pinakasulong na uri ng lipunan. Manalari ang diwa ng proletaryo Bawat hakbang natin patungong sosyalismo Pagpabago ang paggamit ng aking makina Hindi nagagamitin sa pagsasamantala Para sa ipunan ang ating yayarihin Hindi pagkuruguan ng aking lilikari. Ay 
kriyansang manggagawa at magsasama. Lapas sa kapangyarihan, walang hanggan. Babaguhin ang proletaryo ang buong mundo. Bawat hapang natin patungong sosyalismo. Tayo titigil hanggat di nagwawagi Ang ating mitiging magkapantay-pantay Walang magsasamantala, walang mangkaapi Yan ang sandigan ng ating pamumuhay Hindi tayo titigil hanggat di nagwawagi ang ating mitiging magkapantay-pantay Walang magsasamantala, walang magpahabi Yan ang sandigan ng ating pamuhay the last year, last episode for the end line series of this month for your academic and militant needs go to foreign languages press it's a marxist leninist maoist publishing house check out their site at https foreign languages so back to the questions let us talk about socialist economy can you talk about the main changes that need to be made from capitalist to socialist economy the socialist economy has been made possible in world history uh, by the growth of modern industry and the proletariat and industrial capitalism. These forces of production outgrow and rend asunder the capitalist relations of production, which have become their fetters. They therefore become liberated and can grow at an accelerated rate. In a socialist society, Social or public ownership of the means of production replaces private ownership. The new relations of production are made to correspond to the social character of the means of production. The entire mode of production is revolutionized. The proletariat uses its political supremacy to wrest step by step all capital on the bourgeoisie to centralize all instruments of production in the hands of the state and to increase the total productive forces as rapidly as possible in a planned way. The Communist Manifesto lists down a number of measures for revolutionizing the mode of production in the most advanced countries, but at the same time point out that these measures will be different in different countries. The experiences of the Soviet Union and China in carrying out socialist revolution and socialist construction are the best historical examples to study and learn from. Marx's critique of the Gotha program shows how the total product of society is divided. There are the funds for wages, um, to capital reproduction, public welfare, administration and defense. Uh, the wage system is retained but the essential difference between capitalism and socialism in this regard is that there are no more gross disparities in income and that the average level of income is deliberately made to rise above mere subsistence level and is planned to rise above ever higher. The surplus product above wages is no longer appropriated as private income by any exploiting class but used for capital reproduction, public welfare, administration, and defense. Thank you, Tito Jo. Can you explain more the concept of from each according to his ability to each according to his deeds among the working people 
and the government and economic officials uh, in the payment of wages the principle to be followed is from each according to his ability to each according to his deeds uh, there are wages or salary differentials according to differences in productivity a manager or an engineer will still get a higher wage than a skilled worker and the latter will get a higher wage than an unskilled worker or apprentice <clears throat> For a certain period, the industrial proletariat will get higher wages and more benefits from than the peasants, but the latter will soon be benefited by collectivization and mechanization. At the very start, steps are taken to remove the gross disparities in income in the old society. The long-term objective is to remove gross disparities in incomes that result in class differences and keep on raising the general level of the incomes and the quality of life. Certainly, the extremely high salaries for high government officials and high executives of the state and private corporations in the past will be immediately ended. They are reduced in line with the state policy of spreading the available social benefits and mustering the resources for further socioeconomic development instead of favoring the few bureaucrats and technocrats as in the past when they were coddled by the big bourgeoisie and landlords to assist them in oppressing and exploiting the people but the government and economic officials shall be provided with salaries commensurate to their education training and contributions they can gain new motivation and new morality from socialist education it is good policy to treat them fairly and justly and win them over to the socialist revolution. Otherwise, they will emigrate and it will be more costly to hire foreign experts. Thank you, Tito. How will the economic planning be different from the economic planning during capitalism? And national economic planning takes the place of the conflicting calculations by various private firms on the basis of the capitalist market. Production <clears throat> is for use rather than for private profit. The most essential and necessary commodities and projects are given priority. The internal balance and self-reliant development of the socialist economy is carried out. With the social profit taking the place of private profit, a tremendous an ever-increasing amount of the surplus product is released every year for the reproduction of capital. Such ills endemic to capitalism, such as the motive of private profit against social need, misallocation of resources, the anarchy of competition, conspicuous consumption, the business cycle, and excessive military expenditures are done away with. Economic planning is effective because all economic factors are under unified control and all active components of the economy at all levels report the information and recommendations to serve as basis for the plan. An economic plan is the result of the open interaction between the central planning body and lower levels. National goals are related to available resources and actual capacities. Economics acquires the precision of an applied science. In a capitalist society, economics as well as economic planning is really a far more imprecise field of knowledge and is often a guessing game as the individual capitalist firms keep from each other and from the public the timely and accurate information on production, trade, technical and other data, and process which the, they consider trade secrets in the name of private ownership and competition. Only partial information is given publicly by private firms when it serves their, their ends. So we talked about uh, the economic and social aspects in, during scientific socialism, but what about defense, Tito? Defense will be an important concern in a socialist society. Will the cost be as huge as during the capitalist society? Defense is a necessary concern in socialist society. 
without defense, socialist society would be destroyed by its internal and external enemies. But the cost of defense in such a society is relatively far, far smaller than in capitalist society, especially in the case of imperialist powers. Their military expenditures are astronomical in magnitude. Worst of all, the police and military forces are used for the purpose of repression and aggression. The military policy of a socialist society is truly defensive and is opposed to aggression from its own side or from another. The military forces are built according to the principles of the People's Army. In connection with the economy, military units are actually productive units. Aside from being military, political, and educational units, periodically beeping up the standing army, the youth are rotated into military service and training. The people in general are politicized and trained as militia units and are not detached from production. The people's defense is their own home base strength against the aggressor, and it is further strengthened by proletarian internationalism international solidarity with all other peoples and diplomacy and friendly relations with other states and countries on the basis of mutual respect for independence, equality, mutual cooperation and benefit. Then let's go to uh, international cooperations. Can concessions be given to capitalists in a socialist economy? If so, how do we make sure they don't grow and dominate the economy? Maybe you can give us examples from China's experiences. After the people and the People's Army led by the Revolutionary Party of the Proletariat defeat the enemy and take power, the worker state or the People's Democratic State takes over the commanding heights of the economy, such as the existing industries, lines of transport and communications, and sources of raw materials, but conditions might require transition measures, uh, that transition measures are taken in order to revive the economy as soon as possible and to avail of what possible contributions can be made by the rich peasants, traders, the middle bourgeoisie, as in the new economic policy under Lenin, and even the big compradors are required to follow the example of the national bourgeoisie in joining state private corporations and thereby complying with state policy. Lenin adopted the new economic policy in order to revive the economy as soon as possible. <clears throat> After the devastation resulting from the civil war and by the war of foreign intervention, thus the rich peasants and small and medium entrepreneurs and traders were allowed to operate from 1922 to 1928. Stalin ended the NEP to launch the first five-year plan to build socialist industry and carry out the collectivization and mechanization of agriculture. In much of its first decade, China also had a transition period of overcoming war damage, inflation and corruption, supporting the Korean people and combating U.S. aggression and basic socialization of the economy. This was accompanied by the operation of joint state private corporations to integrate and absorb the capital of the bourgeoisie. Payment of dividends was phased out after a number of years. In the Soviet Union, the bourgeoisie resurged from the ranks of the private entrepreneurs, traders, and rich peasants during the new economic policy. But uh, this social strata came uh, under restraint when Stalin launched the policy of uh, socialist industrialization and the collectivization and mechanization of agriculture. Then the left opposition of Trotsky to push the bourgeois line that socialism was impossible in one country and the right opposition of Bukharin pushed the other bourgeois line that the new policy must continue and that capitalist, <clears throat> um, capitalism must uh, be further carried out. In China, Liu Xiaoqi um, and the like pushed the bourgeois line in the late 1950s that the national democratic economy, so-called, must first be developed. 
before there is ground for socialism and that the national capitalist must not be phased out but further given concessions. They also oppose the great leap forward, um, <clears throat> which was planned to counter the natural calamities, the imperialist embargo, and the Soviet Union tearing up previous agreements and contracts with China due to the Sino-Soviet uh, ideological dispute. Under Mao's leadership, China prevailed with the socialist line over the Chinese revisionist and capitalist rulers who persisted until the great proletarian cultural revolution became necessary in 1966. In the process of socialist revolution and construction, the Communist Party as advanced detachment of the proletariat issues the principles and policies to prevent bureaucratic corruption and to have a definite plan for facing out concessions given to the capitalists to keep on advancing the socialist revolution and construction and develop socialist education, culture, and morality. We must learn from the error of Stalin in declaring prematurely the end of classes and class struggle in 1935 and mishandling class contradictions within socialist society and depending on administrative measures. We must also learn from Mao's theory and practice of cultural revolution under proletarian dictatorship in order to combat modern revisionism, prevent the restoration of socialism, and consolidate socialism, as well as from the errors of the Chinese Communist Party <clears throat> of allowing the return to power of revisionist renegades like uh, Deng Xiaoping, who pretended to have been rehabilitated. The danger to socialism comes not only from the imperialists. <clears throat> the danger to socialism comes uh, not only from the imperialists, but also from internal elements who are remnants of uh, the old bourgeoisie or who emerge um, in socialist society um, uh, by first adopting the petty bourgeois mode of thinking while they are in school and then climbing their way to higher positions in the party, state, economy, and cultural institutions while becoming revisionist and bourgeois. Okay, so no to, no to revisionist, Tito. Uh, previously, so, previously, socialist countries have turned into or beca became imperialist countries in history. Where do we draw the line between a leading party that is still pushing for a socialist cause and a party that is transforming into an imperialist one? When the modern revisionists take power in a socialist country, as in the Soviet Union from 19... 56 onwards, they make breaches on the socialist system in order to introduce capitalist reforms, supposedly to strengthen socialism, as Khrushchev did. By the time of Brezhnev, uh, his own pack of modern revisionists turned social imperialist and centralized resources to enlarge bureaucratic corruption and to engage in the arms race with the U.S. as the other superpower in the Cold War. Khrushchev made his counter-revolutionary revisionist coup in the Soviet Union after the death of Stalin. So did Deng Xiaoping in 1976 after the death of Mao. He declared the GPCR as 100% catastrophe and proceeded to adopt the line of outright capitalist reforms, and opening up to the capitalist world. He made China the main partner of U.S. imperialism in carrying out the neoliberal policy of imperialist globalization. China became an imperialist power. For a while, Mao's theory and practice of continuing revolution under proletarian dictatorship through cultural revolution gave hope to proletarian revolutionaries and won most of the time through twists and turns in the 10 years course of uh, the GPCR from 1966 to 1976. While the GPCR posed correctly the problem of modern revisionism and unfolded the basic principles and methods for combating revisionism, still 
the revisionist capitalist rulers headed by Deng were able to defeat the GPCR, restore capitalism, and make China an imperialist power. For a while, um, <clears throat> The defeat of the GPCR, which spelled the victory of capitalism in China over socialism, only means that we need to learn positive and negative lessons from the entire process of socialist revolution and construction up to the end of the GPCR in, in China. In, in the same way that proletarian and revolutionaries learned positive and negative lessons from the victory and defeat of the short-lived Paris Commune of 1871 and from the much longer life and greater consequentiality of the Soviet Union. Okay, Tito, last question before we end the question and answer portion and, and receive questions from the audience. How will the transition from socialism to communism take place? With regard to the transition of socialism into communism, Marx and Engels pro prognosticated the withering of the state the emergence of classless society, the massive and rapid growth of productive forces, and the all-round development of human civilization. The withering of the socialist state or class dictatorship of the proletariat means the steady dissolution of the coercive character of political authority. By then, there shall have been a lessening and finally a disappearance of the need for a distinct class, the proletariat, to hold in check another class, the bourgeoisie, with the use of the coercive apparatuses of the state, like the army, police, courts, and prison. The advance of socialism, especially in, in its mode of production, is expected to dissolve the very conditions that create such antagonistic classes as the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. A generalization and equalization of conditions occur for the benefit of one and all, it is not an impossible dream to anticipate the growth of productivity to the point that all members of society need to work for a far less number of hours than now, have a basic income that assures a comfortable and productive life, and have more time for other creative endeavors in private and, uh, uh, and in public. One knows exactly how the bourgeoisie is differentiated from the proletariat and capitalist society by the right of ownership in the means of production and by extracting profits for themselves the bourgeoisie lives a more comfortable and even luxurious life while the proletariat is consigned to the drudgery of a long daily work routine and the rough conditions of poverty and misery certainly one cannot fail to see the benefits derived by the working class by succeeding through struggle to reduce the working day progressively from 16 hours to eight hours, although the worker still remains exploited in capitalist society. The attainment by all of the material conditions enjoyed by an educated middle class family relying on high salaries and not on private ownership of the means of production is not an impossibility. While well, this is an impossibility uh, for the working class under capitalism, socialism can bring this about because the growth of productive forces and all round social development are no longer restricted as in capitalism and are enhanced <coughs> by the rapid advance of science and technology provided the monopoly capitalist attack uh, on the environment is prevented. Modern industry is capable of wiping out poverty overnight, but capitalism would rather manipulate and restrict the forces of production in order to exact a high rate of profit. Marx pointed out clearly the problems that socialism in transition to communism would have to solve. These are the contradictions between the vestiges of the past and the new socialist society between town and country or industry and agriculture, and between mental and physical work. The contradictions between the vestiges of the past and the new socialist conditions can be solved 
by further developing the achievements of socialist revolution and construction. The contradiction between the town and country or industry and agriculture can be solved by bringing mechanization and the amenities of urban uh, <coughs> life uh, to the countryside and building smaller cities integrated with rural life. The contradiction between physical and mental work can be solved by expanding educational and other cultural facilities, increasing real wages and reducing the workday for all. Since Marx, it has been generally understood that the mode of production can be developed to such a point that the income of producers would no longer be decided according to their productivity. There will be such a superabundance of public facilities and articles of consumption that uh, it will become impertinent for anyone to talk or think of being deprived and disadvantaged regarding these things. Thank you for the great discussion, Tito Joe. And now we're opening the floor for questions. Just leave a comment on this live video on Anakbayan Europa's Facebook page and we'll try to answer all of them. But for now, let's pause for a while and watch this short video on the 10 major reasons for not honoring Marcos as a hero by the NDFP Information Office. It should not be a restoration of socialism. Mm -hmm. uh, consolidation of socialism, it should be prevent the The 14 year long fascist dictator, a traitor, and a criminal of colossal proportions to be honored in any manner as a hero. They cannot forget and forgive his gross and systematic violations of human rights. He was culpable for the murder of at least 3,240 of his political opponents. He caused the torture of at least 34,000 and the illegal imprisonment of 70,000 people. He used his despotic power to enrich himself and his family. He incurred excessive foreign debt for overpriced infrastructure projects. It plundered public resources amounting to at least 167 billion pesos and at least 15 billion U.S. dollars. Second, Marcos was definitively and categorically condemned by the Filipino people as a fascist dictator and was overthrown from the presidency through the sovereign revolutionary act of the people who stormed the presidential palace in, 18, in 1986 and flooded ETSA to persuade the reactionary armed forces to withdraw support from him. Had he not been helicoptered out of his palace by his U.S. imperialist master, he would have been immediately arrested and tried by the Filipino people, or he would have been dealt with summarily, like Mussolini, upon the defeat of the fascists in Italy. Third, but even then his thousands of victims of at least 9,500 sued him for human rights violations in the U.S. judicial system. He was found criminally culpable for these human rights violations. The heirs of his state are under obligation to indemnify the victims. The final U.S. court decision is accepted by the Philippine government which has taken responsibility for processing and distributing indemnification to victims from the erstwhile Swiss bank deposits of the plunderer Marcos. Fourth, in view of its recent decision to allow the remains of Marcos to be buried in the Libingan ng mga bayani, the current majority of the Supreme Court should be reminded that the 1973 Constitution which was used by Marcos to impose fascist dictatorship on the Filipino people, was scrapped upon the downfall of Marcos 
and was replaced by the 1987 Constitution. This current Constitution carries explicit provisions regarding human rights and restraints on presidential powers by way of condemning and repudiating the colossal crimes of the Marcos fascist dictatorship. These were committed through unlimited concentration of executive, legislative, and judicial powers in the hands of one person. Fifth, since the fall of the Marcos dictatorship, the three branches of the Philippine government have always agreed that the Marcoses have engaged in the criminal plunder of public resources and that the ill-gotten wealth must be recovered. Investigations and court proceedings have been successfully undertaken to establish the criminal culpability of Marcos for plunder. Six, no less than the chief PDP Laban party mates of President Duterte, the founder Aquilino Pimentel Sr., and uh, Senate President Aquilino Pimentel III demand that uh, Marcos should not be honored as a hero and the victims of the Marcos dictatorship should not be made to suffer further injustice. Seven, many of those who are personally close to Duterte say that he should not betray the stand of his own late mother who stood up articulately and courageously against the Marcos dictatorship. The Marcos fascist dictatorship is not a good example for Duterte to project an image of strong leadership. He can make a revolutionary stand on issues and he can thus stand as a strong leader of the people. Eighth, Marcos himself wanted to be buried beside his mother why submit to the political whim of his heirs to use the burial of his remains or display of his wax figure at uh, Libingan ng mga bayani as a means of revising history, covering up the monstrous crimes of Marcos and boosting the Marcos family's political stocks? Ninth, to bury the remains of Marcos in Libingan ng mga bayani is a violation of the agreement of President Ramos and the Marcos family that said remains must be buried in Bata, Ilocos Norte. Tenth, too much public resources will be wasted to secure the remains of an arch traitor at Libinga ng Mabiani from being blown up like the oversized bust of Marcos on the way to Baguio. Okay, welcome back. I'm reminding you again to go check out Foreign Languages Press, that press where all of the works of Tito Jomas Tison are available, plus the other works of our um, internationalist, internationalist friends and comrades from all over the world. So go check out Foreign Languages Press, that press. So let's go to the question and answer portion. First question, Tito Jo, why is it that when genuine proletarian leaders die and the revisionists take over, they can easily reverse the victories of the socialist revolution and construction when the party should be collectively led? Well, indeed, uh, it appears that uh, in the case of the Soviet Union and uh, China, soon after the death of uh, the leader, uh, within the Communist Party itself, uh, there is uh, a group that takes over and reverses the line of the previous leader. But I think you have to consider, of course, that's, uh, that's something to take note, no? That um, when uh, the socialist revolution and construction run very well, you don't assume that uh, the law of contradiction doesn't apply anymore. Uh, on the entire process and uh, uh, 
you cannot assume that it does not operate within the Communist Party and the state. But uh, you must also consider certain uh, certain conditions taken advantage of by uh, those who uh, prove to be counter-revolutionaries. Counter-revolutionaries who arise from the Communist Party itself. Uh, so, for instance, um, uh, I've always thought that Hitler was in a way successful in the, um, uh, uh, spearheading the attack on socialism by killing 27 million uh, Soviet people. No? And so this would be capitalized on by Khrushchev, who raised the slogan of uh, bourgeois pacifism. No? And uh, so, and then of course, but the main thing is, uh, of course, uh, there are those within the Communist Party in the, so uh, in the Soviet Union who thought that some amount of capitalism would be helpful to socialism. So they adopted um, uh, capitalist uh, uh, principles and methods. And um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, Khrushchev uh, breached the socialist system in that way by autonomizing factories and communes, making them uh, responsible for their uh, uh, profit and loss, you know, like capitalist firms. You know? And then came um, uh, Brezhnev, uh, who uh, postured as uh, a tough guy, uh, re-centralizing the Soviet economy and Soviet state. Um, but it was for the purpose of, uh, of uh, social uh, imperialism, taking advantage of other countries. Uh, and, and, um, and then it was during the time of uh, uh, Brezhnev, that uh, criminal, uh, criminal syndicates who operated in, uh, in uh, localities would uh, rise up to the level of uh, uh, national power groups. No? Uh, they would, uh, uh, the practice of declaring uh, the production of entire factories defective would become very um, a commonplace. Uh, you know, when they declare the production in a factory as uh, defective, uh, that's for the purpose of taking away, stealing uh, the products and selling them uh, in the uh, private market, no? Um, uh, that was done by the criminal syndicate. So th those are the concrete uh, conditions. Um, and um, Mao thought that uh, with his theory of continuing revolution under proletarian dictatorship uh, through um, cultural revolution, uh, he would be able to uh, combat revisionism, prevent restoration of capitalism, and consolidate socialism for, for a while. It looked that way for some 10 years, uh, you know, but Mao himself in uh, Chinese history had difficulties. He faced difficulties. So when the, the basic socialization of uh, uh, Chinese economy uh, was uh, accomplished in 1958. Uh, so Liu Xiaoqi would propose uh, the further development of a national democratic economy. And they wanted to perpetuate the uh, concessions given to the bourgeoisie. Um, now Mao had to, had to um, sort of uh, uh, do a counteroffensive by using the, by launching the Great Leap Forward, no? And during the Great Leap Forward, uh, there was sabotage being done uh, by uh, uh, revisionists because, you know, uh, in my view, the Chinese Revolution was sort of overtaken by Soviet revisionism. Uh, tens of thousands of Chinese students and worker trainees were, were sent to the Soviet Union at the time that uh, uh, revisionism was being promoted by Khrushchev, no, 1950s. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, by the time, by the 1960s, all these would become, would be occupying um, um, junior and middle positions and even uh, senior positions in the Chinese party and state. So uh, Mao had a difficult time. Um, and um, uh, it was only when the bumper crops of 1962 came that Mao would say, oh, see, I'm correct. Uh, 
and and then uh, yeah. of course china also succeeded in building building enterprises you know um, industrial enterprises in a key part of china uh, in order to preempt uh, imperialist aggression and then he launched uh, he launched this uh, mao was being ridiculed as uh, then as the know everything uh, uh, the know everything uh, uh, leader of a village who knew nothing at all. No? So th there were uh, many articles which ridiculed him, but then he thought that the socialist education movement uh, would uh, be able to combat uh, uh, those um, currents against uh, him and the socialist line. Uh, but that was sabotage. So it became necessary to launch the 19, then they launched the Cultural Revolution in 1966. And uh, there were twists and turns in the, uh, in the GPCR. So in other words, uh, uh, you know, we, when you consider the length of time that uh, Stalin was able to build socialism in the, in the, in the Soviet Union, that would be 19... Uh, at least 1927 uh, to 1953. Um, that's much longer than the, the period of time that Mao was able to um, uh, build uh, socialism in uh, China from uh, 1949 to 19... Um, now I I take uh, I take a um, uh, this is a big uh, historical picture I have no uh, so you know the culture the Paris Commune of 1871 took only about uh, 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 two months before it was defeated but you came the uh, but uh, uh, came the Soviet socialism that would last uh, uh, a long period of time then the Chinese uh, socialist revolution. So uh, those were defeated, but um, I believe the proletariat will never give up the struggle. Uh, there will be new rounds of struggle. Um, and you know, uh, uh, the good thing uh, that has occurred uh, with the, um, with the uh, restoration of capitalism, it's uh, something bad, no? But the good side of it is that uh, there is an increase of imperialist powers uh, in the world capitalist system. And now, so you see right away now, the intensified inter-imperialist contradictions. Uh, the world cannot accommodate two more uh, imperialist powers. And in so short a time, um, you have now the situation in which uh, the whole world capitalist system is cracking up. So. Uh, I think uh, you are lucky uh, to be able to live in the next uh, uh, five decades huh? yeah. uh, to watch the development of the anti-imperialist and democratic struggles, uh, which uh, are now um, cooking up the situation where the proletariat can once again resurge huh? uh, to make its world revolution. So. Uh, I think the best uh, the best thing to do is to be analytical about uh, 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 why, let us say, soon after the death of a great uh, uh, communist leader, you have uh, the restoration of capitalism. That's the best answer I can make. No, um, I think um, uh, there are two results of socialist revolution. In a, in, a, in a particular country like the Soviet Union and uh, uh, China. Uh, industry, in a very backward economy, uh, industries develop, okay? First, it was um, within the socialist frame, but that is uh, according to the law of physics, you don't waste uh, uh, matter and energy. It gets transformed and retransformed, okay? So <laughs> it became the, 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 uh, the, the industry built by socialism uh, has, been, uh, um, has been made capitalist. Now, um, before it becomes socialist again, 
it becomes a big problem eh, to the traditional imperialist powers. Uh, right now, America finds it problematic that there is a China which it uh, it uh, helped up uh, in order and uh, partnered in neoliberal globalization in order to um, in order to um, uh, beat the, the Soviet Union. But then uh, this is a problem for the world capitalist system, and you can bet, eh, you can expect that the proletariat. In China, um, which had, uh, which has been exploited so much, you, know, uh, you can expect that uh, the Maoist forces will someday rise up again in China. And so there are Maoist forces in China. So history doesn't stop. I hope that uh, ans that would answer, no? Um, it involves summing up uh, large events and uh, uh, with some amount of prognostication. Yeah, I think that that's a sufficient and very prog um, comprehensive answer, Tito. Uh, second question, during the time of Duterte's fascism, can we insist on doing cultural revolution? What is the role of the masses to socialist economy? So, Tito, I'll repeat the question. During the time of Duterte's fascism, can we insist on doing a cultural revolution? And what is the role of the masses to a socialist economy? Ah, uh, you refer to the time of Duterte? Yeah. Uh, and doing uh, well, revolution. certainly, uh, I have always spoken of uh, uh, the cultural, uh, the, uh, the aspect of cultural revolution. Uh, in the in the National Democratic Revolution since the 1960s, um, I said that uh, there has to be uh, some kind of cultural revolution, the second propaganda movement, so-called, no? Uh, but it must be aligned with the People's Democratic Revolution. Uh, we cannot have something like the uh, the great uh, proletarian cultural revolution, which uh, was supposed to uh, combat revisionism, uh, co um, uh, consolidate socialism. Uh, so the, the, the character of that cultural revolution is something more in the future and more advanced. It faces, but uh, in the case of uh, uh, the pursuit of the People's Democratic Revolution in the Philippines, there must be a cultural revolution and it must have an anti-imperialist and anti-feudal character and anti-fascist because the bureaucrat capitalism um, as well as comprador uh, capitalism had become the base for fascism that was used by Marcos before, Duterte is using it again. So <clears throat> in very positive terms, the cultural revolution must uh, push to, uh, uh, forward the people's struggle for an full national independence, democracy, social justice, uh, economic development, cultural progress uh, of the type that is um, um, uh, national, scientific, and democratic, and of course, international solidarity is needed. And all these elements must be in the cultural revolution in order to face up uh, and uh, defeat the Duterte uh, tyranny and uh, uh, to combat the state terrorism that Duterte is now carrying out. And um, uh, so uh, it is inevitable that in arousing the people, um, organizing and mobilizing them, you have to uh, make use of um, uh, cultural principles and methods of uh, cultural struggle in order to uh, propagate the line and, and arouse the people to fight the regime. Now, with regard to uh, the, the role of the masses, 
naturally you cannot make any revolution, national democratic or socialist without the masses um, being the main actors. They are the man, main actors. Uh, communist parties, people's armies, uh, mass organizations, uh, um, they are usually uh, less in number and the uh, broad masses of the people. Uh, uh, what is important about these organized forces is that they're solid and they can uh, take leadership. But without the revolutionary masses, uh, you cannot accomplish uh, you can accomplish the People's Democratic Revolution and you cannot proceed to socialist construction and... Uh, and you need yeah. Well, uh, countering fear during the time of, uh, of uh, Duterte, uh, I think uh, there is a mix up here no? about uh, two kinds of situations. I've just left the uh, thing about Duterte naturally. Uh, there must be a cultural revolution which uh, uh, encourages the spirit of daring to fight, no? not being afraid. No? Uh, and there are so many uh, artistic ways and cultural ways of um, uh, raising up the fighting spirit of the people. No? Um, so, and uh, there are also, there is also the cultural program uh, with uh, some sustained content, no? Like uh, it must be national, scientific, and uh, pro masses, no? Um, now, uh, <laughs> let me move on again to the role of the masses in uh, socialist economy, or for that matter, in any kind of uh, large social development, like People's Democratic Revolution or Socialist Revolution. Without the masses, the party cannot do anything. As a matter of fact, um, uh, the masses must first decide, uh, you know, according to Lenin, there are three elements. There must be a crisis that afflicts the ruling system and makes it incapable of ruling in the old way. Now, the people who are so pressed and exploited must desire revolutionary change, okay? Without the masses desiring revolutionary change, uh, the party of whatever strength cannot do anything, no? Now, with the masses uh, interested in revolutionary change, then it is good to have a strong revolutionary party. So you have, uh, you have the right thing that corresponds to the desire, a strong communist party capable of leading the masses. Always the masses would determine the outcome of the large historical event, no? uh, which is revolution or building uh, the socialist economy. Okay, so next question, Tito Jo. Socialist from Dan Borhal. Socialism in one country and even in several countries has been proven to be possible. Do you think communism is possible in one or several, several countries while imperialist countries still exist? Indeed, it has been proven that socialism in one country is possible. And so, uh, in practice, uh, the Trotsky and his followers were debunked a long time by the practice of socialist revolution in the Soviet Union. But with regard to the question of a classless society called communism, uh, is it possible to have it in one or uh, several countries? Um, uh, the uh, um, consensus among Marxist Leninists is that, uh, and I think it's the correct uh, consensus, that uh, uh, communism is impossible where, uh, while imperialism still exists. Because you cannot have a classless society without any, uh, any state uh, to defend a country while imperialism is still alive and kicking. So a precondition to the emergence of uh, communism is the defeat, the defeat of uh, uh, imperialism. So in other words, while imperialism is not yet defeated, there is a need for the socialist state and there is a need for the socialist societies. For the army, the courts. <laughs> Um, yeah, the uh, socialist uh, 
a society cannot let its uh, guard down without having uh, well, without having uh, the means of the state to protect itself from fifth columnist agents of imperialism within uh, that socialist country and uh, without an army to defend uh, a socialist country uh, from the threats posed by imperialism, by, by an imperialist power from the outside. Yeah, Actually, that's the, that's the, uh, what you might call the delaying factor in the attainment of, mm -hmm. uh, of communism, because uh, um, the, the state cannot be dissolved uh, while imperialism uh, is still around to threaten a socialist society. Yeah, Tito, and it also like gives hope and reason for other um, nations to fight and struggle for socialism. Um, next question. The solidarity or supporters of the Philippine Revolution say that there is a, already a socialist state in the Philippines because of the revolutionary forces in the countryside. Is this a correct analysis? No, I don't think so. You can build uh, a socialist society while uh, uh, the uh, revolutionary forces and people in the Philippines are, are still engaged in people's democratic revolution through protracted people's war. Um, you know, uh, there is still instability even in uh, areas that are relatively stable where the revolutionary movement uh, is already strong, building its own government, no? Yeah. Uh, revolutionary government with the local organs of political power, yet the enemy can still attack anytime. And uh, so there is a fluid situation. There is still a tug of war. Um, and uh, of course, uh, as the strength of the revolutionary movement will rise, it, uh, its areas will become, uh, will become more stable. Uh, you, kind of, you can speak of stable base areas, uh, whereas before, uh, you know, these are, the these are the calibrated terms. First, in the, in the Philippine revolutionary movement, we had only guerrilla zones, not even guerrilla bases, guerrilla zones. And we, then we advanced to um, consolidated guerrilla zones uh, in comparison to unconsolidated ones. Uh, you know, new uh, new guerrilla zones. Then later on, we could distinguish the guerrilla base from the, uh, the guerrilla zones. Okay, so you it gets the uh, you know as the strength of the revolutionary movement rises, you have, you get this uh, uh, higher uh, higher terms or higher categories. Then after the guerrilla bases, I'm sure you're going to have the stable base areas. Uh? Now, uh, let's take the stable areas uh, in China before uh, the Kuomintang was totally defeated. No, let's say in Yan'an. In Yan'an, um, well, forms of cooperation, rudimentary cooperation uh, at household and uh, uh, the level of uh, local communities could be carried out. So it's some kind of a, um, um, in a manner of speaking, um, it's some kind of uh, uh, collectivity and uh, cooperation. But you don't call that socialism yet because uh, many basic elements to run a modern uh, society of the proletariat uh, 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 are not yet present, no? So uh, the term socialism uh, should be reserved for uh, higher levels of development, especially it should be reserved after actually the, the enemy, class enemy is entirely defeated, no? Uh, you know, there are some romantics eh, in the revolutionary movement uh, well, they are not strict Marxist-Leninist, uh, but uh, um, you must have uh, come across certain writers who speak of socialism in the guerrilla fronts and so on and so forth. But uh, that is, uh, the, there is a lot of imprecision in the use of such terms. So I would advise uh, uh, 
precise use of terms because there are already there are terms that are that are um, uh, more scientifically descriptive and useful, uh, but illusory terms can be misleading. So uh, I would say uh, socialism cannot yet exist in the guerrilla fronts of the <laughs> in the Philippines at the moment. Uh, more effort uh, has to be exerted. Uh, in order to reach that level. And I think that term should be reserved for the overthrow, not only of Duterte, but the entire ruling system. Yeah, you're right, Tito. Um, we should never romanticize the revolution. Uh, rather, do our best to uh, triumph the people's revolution. So, Tito, next question. Javier Har Hardeleza asked, does the Russian and Chinese people especially the working class and the peasants need to launch a new democrat democratic revolution with a socialist perspective to overthrow the ruling class in the current context of imperialist Russia, Russia and China? Maraming salamat po. Well, you see, uh, the uh, after some work of subversion by the modern revisionists, they really degenerated the entire uh, what used to be the socialist society. And uh, uh, by the time that uh, uh, these uh, societies uh, were being cast away, the masses themselves rose up against these revisionist regimes. Huh? Uh, you see, because, uh, well, there, there was a misrepresentation of the revisionist rulers that they were still, uh, they were still capitalist, okay? Uh, but, um, in other words, they dirtied up the name socialism for a while, but the, peop the people now see through eh, this uh, misappropriation of the term uh, socialism uh, by revisionists. They misappropriated it to mean capitalist restoration. Now, after so long, uh, quite a number of uh, developments have occurred. Uh, you know, um, uh, soon after the full restoration of capitalism in uh, the Soviet Union, or uh, um, mainly uh, we, we can focus on Russia, uh, really life deteriorated in, this, in Russia and in the rest of what used to be the Soviet Union. Life deteriorated. Even the life expectancy was, and, and expect, expectancy um, uh, died, no? And um, all the achievements of socialism were, uh, shall we say, um, were uh, undermined and uh, uh, destabilized. And, uh, uh, and then uh, the prognostication was that uh, the Russia would uh, simply proceed to, de to deteriorating. But Russia was able to bounce back, even if in the capitalist way, no? And that is a problem for the traditional imperialist powers. And in the case of China, uh, uh, it soon, it soon, when it was uh, getting all those concessions in terms of uh, uh, sweatshop operations and the outsourcing of uh, consumer manufacturing, uh, China just the same had a big problem. Uh, it was hit by economic crisis corruption and uh, and uh, inflation no so that was there was the Tiananmen in 1989 but uh, um, uh, Deng Xiaoping pleaded to the US to have more concessions and by the 1990s China was able to fix its economy the capitalist way and even became the main partner of the US in neoliberal globalization and it has come to pass that this that, that China is now regarded by the U.S. As its, as its main economic competitor and political rival. So uh, certain changes have occurred. But um, there is now a situation in the relationship between the U.S. and China that can, there can be mutual damage between them as they try to cut each other down. Uh, China is still pleading to maintain eh, the um, uh, the cooperation that went on for four decades, um, but the U.S. Uh, is 
is the uh, crucial side in the sense that it wants to regain its uh, unquestioned number one position, no? And it is in a position to do damage because China, uh, China rose up because of the export surplus it got from the U.S. market, no? And indeed, it was able to upgrade its technology uh, by uh, uh, getting um, uh, Chinese uh, U.S. investments in China and then sending students to uh, to, uh, to pry into the research laboratory. So you know, uh, U.S. now accuses China of stealing technology. Okay, so um, now the, uh, the U.S. wants to cut down uh, all these advantages of China. And um, uh, China, in, uh, as even if I uh, even if I say that uh, China was able to fix itself up better than the, uh, Russia, uh, China has uh, weaknesses internal. It is sitting. It is um, it is afflicted with so much corruption. No, uh, it is sitting on on uh, on the mountains on mountains of bad debts. No. And then it has overextended itself, no, by trying to uh, build a new trade route, no, uh, on land, no, in the, through its uh, Belt Road Initiative. And it is uh, so ambitious as to engage in maritime imperialism, no, in the South China Sea. And uh, China and the U.S. and other capitalist powers are reacting to this. So, um, uh, uh, the U.S. also has a problem how it can revive its uh, its uh, uh, manufacturing, which has gone down. No, it benefited with the Chinese bourgeoisie, the American bourgeoisie uh, benefited from the exploitation of cheap Chinese labor. No, now <laughs> I don't know what the uh, what the, the most <laughs> that I, the most immediate thing that the U.S. can do right now is to use uh, Indian cheap labor this time, no, to counter uh, uh, <laughs> China. But uh, within China itself, uh, uh, there are the proletariat can rise because you don't throw away the experience, uh, the revolutionary experience. It is entirely possible that uh, 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 the proletariat. There are Maoist organizations within China, and uh, although at the same time there is a contest, no, the U.S. now wants China to throw away the red flag, no, um, but uh, at the moment it's no longer so much interested in that. Uh, uh, it, it really wants to put China at a lower, uh, at a low, in a lower position. Um, the ideological objective of uh, uh, having China to throw away. Uh, the red flag and its pretension of being still uh, uh, socialist, uh, uh, that uh, matters little now. Um, the, uh, so, uh, but there is the, there is the uh, big bourgeoisie in China, in the state, uh, whose cousins are in the private uh, capitalist sector, okay? So they themselves would like to throw away the the, the flag and adopt uh, uh, bourgeois uh, bourgeois democracy. And there is a current because uh, actually that's the pretty expression for the fact that they would like to be further assured that uh, the assets that they were able to build for some time really belongs to, uh, really really. Uh, belong to them because you know um, with the infighting in China now um, uh, there are capitalists who are insecure that uh, the advantages that they got from the state uh, 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 privileges from the state uh, are the same argument for taking back those assets certain assets uh, have been taken back from pers from from certain private groups uh, private uh, uh, billionaires and uh, um, so you have and uh, the law of contradiction is operating to be brief the law of contradiction is operating uh, within uh, Chinese society and there is a struggle between the the Chinese bourgeoisie and the proletariat the proletariat has been exploited for four decades already and um, if there is a deterioration of their uh, situation, they will uh, they will rise up. So um, nothing uh, like 
like uh, all Marxists believe, uh, nothing stands still. Things yeah. keep on changing. And uh, uh, do not, uh, uh, four decades of capitalism in China should be able to generate some kind of strong opposition, even if only in the form of, uh, uh, you know, uh, what you would expect in a an industrial capitalist society, more and uh, more and more uh, assertive trade unions, and then uh, and uh, it so happens that uh, there are reports that uh, uh, there is even an underground uh, Maoist movement. So uh, quite different from the expectation of. Uh, uh, trade unionism arising from um, the development of capitalism. Okay, and is that? Uh, 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 okay. Um, yes, Tito. Next question: How will justice be implemented in socialism? How is it different from legalism of bourgeois democracy? Well, the biggest social justice is uh, that. The the workers uh, uh, do not have any more to deliver the uh, 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 total product of their labor, and they only get the wages. And uh, what remains, the, the the surplus value remains in the hands of the of the capitalist. Huh? And you know, under neoliberalism, that kind of exploitation is uh, even uh, aggravated. No. Uh, it is very systematic, and uh, there is the insulting line that it is the bourgeoisie that creates wealth. No, no longer the uh, no longer the workers. You know, Adam Smith uh, recognized uh, the class, the, the the classical economists like Adam Smith, Raymond Ricardo, and the like, recognized that uh, new material values are created by workers. No. Um, they work on the objects of labor from nature, and it is the work, the labor power of the workers that uh, create new material values. But you know, under neoliberalism, it has nothing to do with classical liberalism. Um, uh, in the economic uh, field or in the political field, uh, the line of neoliberalism uh, is that uh, it's an unbridled greed. Uh, the line is that when the capitalist is responsible for creating wealth and creating jobs, so as much as possible, uh, capital must be increased in the hands of the bourgeoisie. And how do you do it? Uh, give them tax exemptions um, and uh, uh, bring down the wages of workers and then uh, uh, cut down on uh, social services and uh, liberalize uh, uh, investments. And trade and uh, uh, financial policy and uh, deregulate, um, remove restrictions on the abuse of uh, women, children, and the environment, and so on, and, and also denationalize the economy of the um, of the less developed countries. You know? So all privileges, uh, privatize, privatize. Uh, public assets so that the capitalists will have better chances of accumulating more capital and so on and so forth. So that's neoliberalism. Uh, um, this has been running for four decades and this is too much. And I think the workers and other working people are, uh, have gotten tired of it. No, All, all that story about uh, uh, letting the bourgeoisie, the monopoly bourgeoisie, uh, earn as much capital as they can, accumulate as much capital as, as, they, uh, as they can, and then um, uh, and their uh, and then they will lift up everyone that has that can become true uh, on the other hand uh, you have uh, the crisis of overproduction you have worsening conditions of uh, unemployment and mass poverty so people we're all working people now are uh, are uh, resisting and last year and even in this time of covid no this year uh, there are now there are no um, uh, there are no protest mass actions against neoliberalism, fascism, racism, and so on. All manifestations of uh, the capitalist system. So anyway, um, when I say the biggest justice 
that is accomplished upon upon uh, the making of a, a socialist society is that you remove oppression and exploitation under capitalism. That's the biggest justice to start with. And then when it comes to, let's say, rights of individuals, groups, communities, women, and so on and so forth, those are taken care of in a socialist democracy. Uh, socialist dictatorship is turned against the imperialist and the bourgeoisie, but it makes possible, it enables socialist democracy eh, for the benefit of the people. That's the, that's the big justice that is done. And um, um, I wrote to once in, in the 1960s, and there are three levels of freedom that must be assured. No? Um, uh, the three levels pertain to individuals, no? So, you know, socialist constitutions, you will observe, carry over the rights of individuals in the Bill of Rights of a socialist constitution. And then what is absent in a bourgeois constitution is, you know, class freedom of the exploited from the exploiters. That's another level. And then Another level is freedom of the entire nation um, from imperialist domination and exploitation. So <clears throat> uh, democracy is assured that way at three levels of uh, three operative levels uh, of freedom. Okay, next question, Tito. Last two questions, actually. Conversely, in a socialist society, how will a country handle the inter-imperialist war if ever it will be caught in the middle, just like what is happening now with the Philippines with the China and U.S. war aggressions? A socialist society has to um, uh, has to avoid getting embroiled into any war uh, with another country. Um, as I pointed out, uh, a socialist society can fix its own uh, can fix its own conditions. Uh, so uh, there are no weaknesses that can be taken advantage of by outsiders. Okay, as well as uh, fib columnists of the outsiders. Then. Um, it must uh, positively employ international solidarity with all other peoples and other countries of various systems uh, for the purpose of, uh, of uh, development and peace. And then it must, um, it, must, uh, uh, it must carry out not only solidarity among peoples, but diplomacy um, before before war becomes an option, uh, all opportunities for diplomacy must be taken advantage of. But anyway, a socialist society never looks for trouble. It's usually the imperialist uh, trying to um, barge in or to take advantage of a uh, socialist country. So it is in the nature of a socialist country to avoid war and to prevent war and uh, so that it cannot be easily bullied yeah? it cannot be uh, easily uh, it cannot easily be uh, manipulated uh, for the purpose of war by any other country it must have its own independent uh, um, uh, means of defense that's why defense is important while imperialism exists while imperialism exists war is always a possibility. Um, but uh, in the last more than 70 years, the imperialists have been able to avoid war, direct wars among themselves. They use uh, regional and um, uh, uh, regional wars and proxy wars, but they never uh, get into a direct shooting war because they are afraid of their own weapons of mass destruction. Uh, but you never can tell if uh, uh, a, a country, a, an imperialist country, would be uh, taken over by a fascist, uh, a crazy fascist group. No, 
and uh, which will become irresponsible. Uh, but you know, you know the solution for the imperialist powers in avoiding war? Eh? They shift the burden of crisis eh, to the third world countries. That's why you have this uh, uh, IMF, World Bank, uh, uh, WTO and the UN agencies for passing the burden to the imperialist countries. And uh, uh, when wars occur, it's usually at the expense of the people. That's what the U.S. does. Um, yeah. So, um, the so what does a socialist country uh, do? It must take care of its affairs, internal affairs, very well, and it must have a defense. It must be able to uh, 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 do international solidarity and diplomacy. And it must um, uh, avoid. Uh, it must be able to um, to fend off uh, provocations. Uh, a socialist society will always attract uh, uh, economic embargo, uh, military blockade, uh, and even threats of aggression by imperialist powers. So, uh, a socialist society must be prepared for that. Now, with regard to um, uh, in the Philippines, uh, the Philippines is mentioned, the pl Philippines is a sort of a plaything because you have puppets uh, in charge of the Philippines, like Duterte. Um, now, this gives me a chance to discuss uh, uh, certain major changes in uh, recent years, especially during the time of Duterte. Duterte is still a puppet of the U.S., he has not changed the treaties, arrangements, and um, arrangements um, that tie the Philippines to the U.S. Uh, economically, politically, militarily, and culturally. Um, and the U.S. and Duterte tries to maintain support for him by promising to wipe out eh, the revolutionary movement. Uh, that's the main thing that's uh, keeping the U.S. in supporting Duterte. And Duterte also promises that if there is charter change, then uh, the U.S. corporations will get unlimited ownership of Philippine land, natural resources, um, uh, public utilities, and all other types of businesses. So, um, now in the case of China, oh, uh, so... Uh, Duterte is trying hard also to have a second imperialist master. Before, it would have been no problem, and it looked like there was no problem in 2016, eh? uh, before Trump started to trump uh, China. <clears throat> um, it looked like there, uh, but, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, Duterte is surrounded by pro-U.S. military officers, okay? That's one ring. Duterte is even uh, surrounded by an inner circle of uh, a Chinese businessmen in Dabao. Huh? So, and uh, Duterte wants to make, uh, make money at two levels in relations with the Chinese government by getting high interest loans and uh, overpriced infrastructure. So he was expecting $24 billion uh, worth of infrastructure projects that would be carried out by Chinese contractors. He was expecting, <clears throat> but so far only a portion of that has been released by the Chinese because uh, the Chinese government would like him to, you know, to make an, a more outlier, outright, a more blatant huh, surrender of sovereign rights over this, uh, the West Philippine Sea. So, uh, but Duterte um, clings, and there is also a report that Duterte, uh, the bribe money that he gets from the Chinese and from the criminal syndicates, he deposits them his money, um, and also the other loot uh, that he gets from his bureaucratic corruption, he deposits them in Chinese banks, uh, and uh, he also buys uh, uh, assets in the stock uh, and, and securities in uh, in China. Then the, the other level at which the Duterte makes money in his relations with China is 
particularly his relations with criminal triad, uh, triad uh, syndicate. So um, <clears throat> uh, those uh, uh, engaged in uh, uh, smuggling uh, drugs into the Philippines, rice and other commodities, as well as operating casinos in the Philippines. Duterte is a cut in those operations. And he gets a lot of money. And so, uh, so you, you see, uh, Duterte tries to serve two imperialist masters um, and, um, and for his personal benefit. But now the, the problem for Duterte now is this. Huh? Uh, you know, the uh, conflict between U.S. and China is heating up. Huh? <clears throat> As... Uh, especially in the time of Obama, the U.S. was already uh, observant of the, uh, China's economic and military rise, but the but the reactions were still uh, limited. No, so but anyway, uh, it aroused uh, the reactions of the U.S. were significant enough uh, to notice. No? So. <clears throat> Uh, remember, Obama declared strategic shift to uh, East Asia, and then he also uh, proposed uh, a Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, which excluded China. And now comes the time of uh, uh, Trump. Uh, conditions have become uh, uh, um, more conducive uh, to the uh, sharpening uh, of the conflict between U.S. and China. Um, Trump has, uh, since uh, uh, the national uh, security strategy of uh, 2017 was uh, issued by uh, uh, the U.S. strategic planners, uh, identifying China as the main economic rival and chief political rival of the U.S., uh, Trump has been hitting China as uh, one manipulating its two-tiered economy, manipulating trade, economic and financial policies, and stealing stealing technology um, uh, by copying uh, uh, the technology used by um, uh, U.S. Uh, U.S. enterprises in China, as well as uh, uh, students and researchers of China, stealing from uh, American research laboratories. So the you know the, the the conflict has become more intense than before. So uh, now, etong uh, ginawa. This is what uh, Duterte has done, uh, which can which uh, is very offensive to the U.S. Um, uh, Duterte has allowed and encouraged China to build practically seven military bases, yung, you know, artificial islands in the exclusive economic zone in the Philippines. Uh, uh, China built uh, built them up uh, using Philippine soil, huh? <laughs> and then uh, uh, militarizing them. So they are military bases. I don't think the U.S. likes that, no? Uh, and then uh, also, while U.S. is campaigning against Huawei and uh, uh, China Telecom, Duterte allowed eh, uh, uh, China Telecom and um, and uh, Dito Telecommunity of Dennis Oi eh, to put up cell towers in um, military camps in the Philippines. And uh, you have a ridiculous picture of U.S. having facilities inside those camps also, under EDCA, under uh, Visiting Forces Agreement and uh, EDCA. So you have two imperialist powers now uh, with the facilities inside uh, the puppet military camp, no? <laughs> what? So there are more things that uh, 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 that um, that can put uh, Duterte into trouble with having uh, two conflicting imperialist masters. Okay, last question, Tito Joe. 
and and sorry sorry that we're closing the floor for the questions but this is the last question for tonight the, the correct handling of transition measures that communist parties are forced to adopt often determine whether socialism can develop or capitalism is restored. What will be the general guidelines for a party confronted with such a challenge? Uh, could you repeat the question? Oh, yeah. Uh, the correct handling of transition measures that communist parties are forced to adopt often determine whether socialism can develop or cap capitalism is restored. What will be the general guidelines for a party confronted with a challenge? Oh, yeah, the, the, uh, the correct handling of transition measures. Well, um, the transition measures are determined by the conditions. Um, you know, just after the war, uh, for instance, um, uh, the Soviet Union could not help uh, the Chinese. So uh, the Chinese had to learn from uh, Soviet experience how to manage things according to their own concrete conditions. And they could learn from the experience of the national, of the new economic policy. That's why concessions were given to the capitalists. No? Um, in, I, let me talk in very large terms how uh, proletarian revolutionaries learn from previous experiences. Um, you see, the Paris Commune of uh, 1871 succeeded for two months and provided both positive and negative lessons. And uh, so, but anyway, in positive terms, it demonstrated that it was the prototype of the proletarian dictatorship. And uh, weaknesses were due to, you know, departures, um, flaws in having um, a proletarian dictatorship. Um, uh, for instance, uh, and it did not uh, wage an offensive immediately against uh, Versailles. And uh, uh, there had, so, <clears throat> you know what? Uh, Lenin learned very much from the Paris Commune of 1871. That's why uh, Lenin um, devoted his life to building a, the, the vanguard party uh, of the working class and as for the purpose of creating creating uh, the proletarian dictatorship uh, through the revolutionary action uh, as a result of the uh, imperialist war. So uh, something was learned from the past. And also, um, as I've just pointed out, Mao learned from uh, the experience of Stalin and also uh, the experience of Lenin. So you have these transition measures um, of um, giving concessions <clears throat> because, you know, um, it is called the Lenin policy uh, of buying off, uh, buying off the bourgeoisie. Because you see, uh, if, uh, if the bourgeois managers of enterprises run away, you will spend a lot more hiring foreign experts, even if they come from fellow socialist countries. You have to build, uh, you know, facilities for them. But uh, if, you, if you buy them off, you give them good salaries, they stay, and they will continue to manage. If, uh, uh, if they can sabotage the enterprises, um, and you know, before uh, a revolutionary movement wins, there are already insiders in the capitalist enterprises. And uh, so um, uh, there are, there are managers, managers who even belong to the revolutionary movement and make sure that the enterprises are, uh, are protected from sabotage by the losing bourgeoisie. So you get all those things. Um, there are those calculations, no? Uh, only Trotskyites cannot uh, imagine uh, uh, how, how a, uh, uh, a proletarian revolutionary party would manage things. <clears throat> um, so, um, uh, and then, uh, so Mao learned something from the, um, uh, from the Soviet Union, which would be later afflicted by modern revisionism. Then China itself would be afflicted by revisionism. It turns out Deng Xiaoping was, a cap was, a, was an incorrigible capitalist roader, and he represented uh, a decisive bloc. You know? But 
we also learn, eh? we learn positive and negative lessons from the Chinese experience. So um, the theory of continuing revolution through cultural revolution, that's a big thing. Eh? You know, uh, uh, if you can do cultural revolution consistently because you have learned so much from Mao, then uh, you can counter revisionism uh, for a longer period of time. Um, <clears throat> uh, China was able to do a lot of things to demonstrate uh, what are the problems, to pose what are the problems, and to show what solutions can be made. But it's simply China itself was afflicted by, you know, uh, the disease of provisionism through elements that uh, had, had studied in the Soviet Union. And uh, many scholars do not, um, do not uh, point that out, no? Uh, and many uh, uh, theoreticians, but uh, it is good that uh, uh, even as there were uh, limitations and weaknesses in the Cultural Revolution, uh, it was the best thing possible that could be done. And it is so, it's a source of uh, positive and negative lessons, more of positive in terms of principles and methods of um, of facing up to the danger of revision of capitalist restoration. So uh, the uh, the revolutionary movement of the working class uh, for socialism and communism keeps on learning uh, from experiences, and uh, and experience keeps on becoming bigger. I think uh, I think the. Uh, socialist revolutions of the 20th century will be surpassed by the revolutions in the in the later part of the 21st century. You will be able to uh, see at least the outline of this uh, new surge of revolution. At the moment, uh, you cannot tell how fast, really, uh, the resurgence of the world proletarian revolution, because. Uh, um, uh, science and technology and uh, uh, experiences in in social revolution have already been, uh, have become so great and of course the tendency of imp of uh, the world capitalist system to crack up uh, uh, has become um, uh, demonstratively uh, uh, worse and it is worsening at an accelerated rate. Um, you see, um, since the neoliberal policy was adopted and uh, it started to crack up, uh, um, more than a hundred crises have occurred. You, you notice only the big ones, you know, like um, the, um, say, the most prominent uh, uh, in recent times would be the, the 2008 financial crisis. Now, uh, another bigger crisis is shaping up uh, in these years of 2018, 2009, uh, uh, to 2020 and further on. From year to year, the worsening uh, continues. And, um, um, uh, you know, there is a possibility for uh, uh, with the uh, with the um, uh, extremely efficient means of communication uh, due to quantum physics, uh, you see uh, the capitalist class benefits first from that. But the working class uh, and other people also benefit from it. No, it's just as Lenin. Uh, uh, benefited from the from the train, no, uh, from the train as a mode of communication. Uh, now you have uh, instantly uh, what you say now here it, it spreads throughout the world, no. And uh, when the crisis becomes so much, uh, all the propaganda of the enemy will be nothing uh, in comparison. To the crisis supporting uh, the revolutionary propaganda, and that's how fast revolution can occur. Uh, the there are the means, uh, you know, the the means uh, with the adoption of higher technology, uh, uh, 
the crisis of overproduction has become more rapid, no? And with the with this um, um, faster uh, media of communication, people communicate with each other, and they can ag easily agree on what action to take. So you know there are uh, there are three uh, areas of action for the people. No? You have the um, you have actions that are necessary um, from the people with regard to the class struggle and anti-imperialist struggle. Then you also have uh, a struggle to disable the monopoly bourgeoisie from using its weapons of mass destruction. And also you have the, the struggles necessary for uh, 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 for preventing uh, the monopoly bourgeoisie from plundering, degrading, and uh, ruining the um, uh, environment to the point of uh, endangering the very existence of humankind. No? And uh, I think um, uh, the people uh, uh, have the means now of communication to uh, to agree uh, instantly on what to do uh, against uh, against the dangers posed by um, uh, uh, imperialism uh, in the fields of um, imposing neoliberalism in the fields of uh, threatening the uh, um, the people with nuclear and other weapons of mass destruction and uh, ruining uh, the the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so thank you, Tito. That was a very illuminating discussion. Uh, join us again for the next episodes of ND Line Online next um, in the next few weeks. Uh, Tito, do you have anything more to say before we, we end the discussion? Uh, what I would like to uh, say is that uh, uh, I congratulate uh, all, the, all the participants in this uh, webinar series. We have completed the series and so uh, I congratulate all of you. I'm happy that uh, you have uh, your part uh, uh, in the realization of the series and uh, May you learn uh, certain ideas which can be useful in the uh, practical revolutionary struggle. So I will give you my best wishes. Um, uh, my certificates. And uh, well, uh, it depends on the uh, organizers of the webinar series, how to relate uh, with you further. Um, as far as I'm concerned, you can relate with me further by reading my books. They're, they're all, they're available from the uh, uh, libraries and from the booksellers. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, th thank you for all the participants. Uh, you've made it, th you've made the series very successful. And tune in for more episodes. Uh, just check regularly. Check on the Anakbayan Europa's page. And again, um, check check Foreign Languages Press for to for, if you want to purchase Tito Jo's books. They're all available there. And yeah, uh, good night and mapagpalayang gabi sa lahat. <laughs> Yeah.